Of all the skills you could attribute to high performers, motivation, tenacity, determination, the ability to write well rarely makes the list. Yet, it doesn't matter whether you're leading a team, writing an essay, launching a newsletter, or building a personal brand. Good writing is a superpower. It's a skill we should all learn if we want to do just about anything in life. Writing feels like one of those skills that should be really quite straightforward. Now, after 20 plus years of writing in school and university, you can certainly see why that would be the case. But unfortunately, the way that we're taught how to write at school and university is completely wrong because writing is more than just transferring information to the reader. Writing is a really powerful tool that you can use to help grow your business or to build an audience or to influence and persuade people to do things. And so in this video, I want to give you my 10 key tips when it comes to writing and writing well. Before you put even a single word on the piece of paper, you need to think, who are you writing for? Who is your audience? And what do they care about? Now, this is really important because you can't write something well unless you know the audience that you're trying to address and the problems that they have. So for instance, if I was writing an essay for a lecturer, then they're going to require different things and want different things than if I was, you know, doing an advert or writing a copy for an advert for a toy for a child. And so, you really need to adapt your message and adapt what you're trying to say and how you're trying to say it, depending on who's going to be reading it. Now, there is honestly no single right or wrong audience. For instance, Stephen King, who's one of the best horror writers ever, actually writes for his wife, Tabitha. So you just need to have this idea of who's going to be reading the book, have a pictorial representation of who they are, actually write to them rather than some sort of faceless reader. In screenwriting, there's this thing called a logline, which is essentially just a one or two sentence summary which explains the plot, characters, conflicts, and you know the general outline of what's going to be in the movie. For example, let me read you a couple of loglines that you might recognize. During a preview tour, a theme park suffers a major power breakdown that allows its cloned dinosaur exhibits to run amok. And a computer hacker learns from mysterious rebels about the true nature of his reality and his role in the war against its controllers. Now, there are no points for guessing what those loglines are from, but they are from Jurassic Park and The Matrix. And the whole point of the logline is to make you excited and demonstrate clear value as to what the movie is supposed to be about. And we can use the same concept for writing. You know, if we can summarize what we want to say in just one or two sentences we, and get excited by that, then we know we're onto something pretty good. We know that we're going to be writing something that's going to intrigue and excite the reader. But if we write those one or two sentences and they don't excite or don't intrigue you, then why would the reader want to read 5, 10, 20, 100 plus pages of what you're about to write? So really think about how you're going to summarise and condense that information into one or two sentences and if that's going to grab the reader's attention. If it doesn't, go back to the logline and try again. A reader should be able to understand what you're trying to say by just skimming through your writing. And we have this idea that writing should be this sort of fluffy, long-winded piece of text, when in reality we should be using subheadings, shorter paragraphs, italics, balding stuff to make it really clear what information is useful and what information is less useful, to make that reading process as easy as possible for the reader. At any point while reading, the reader should be able to stop and skip sections and whiz through sections and slow down in certain sections too and still know where they are and not get lost within what we're trying to construct. You see, whenever we're reading something, there are certain parts that the reader isn't going to find particularly useful. So the more that we can help the reader to just jump to the information that they're going to find relevant, the better experience it is going to be for them. So good writing is well signposted and shows what information is important and what information is less important. The ability to signpost and structure your thoughts is probably the biggest differentiator between speaking and writing. As Dave Nunes, the documentation manager at Stripe explains, writing forces you to structure your thoughts in a manner just not possible when you verbalize it. When I write, I have to offer structured, precise thoughts. So use this huge benefit of writing to your advantage. Break down huge chunks of text into small paragraphs and bold the most relevant information and clearly show your reader that you're trying to help them rather than hinder them. This may sound counterintuitive, but to write well, you can't be afraid of creating a quick, messy first draft. You can't be afraid to write down your ideas in a poor, unstructured manner. And although we want to get to a point where it is structured and it is a very well-crafted document, 
The point is, is that we're never going to hit the bullseye first time round. Writing in its initial stages is like exploration. We begin by going wide so that we can cover as much ground as possible, so that later we can go deep. For instance, whenever I write anything, whether it's an essay, a document, or an email, I'll literally set myself a time limit, whether it's 10 minutes, half an hour, an hour, and I'll tell myself I have to write down whatever I can within that time frame. I have to finish that document within that time. And it doesn't really matter how it looks. I, you know, there's no pressure on me to make it perfect. The important point is, is I've got my thoughts down, which I then can reorganize at a later date. When we eventually get round to organising our thoughts, the one writing tip to rule them all is that clarity comes first. In other words, our writing must be as clear as possible. You see, ambiguity has absolutely no place in writing. If our documents or ad copy or essays or whatever we're writing is a little bit unclear, a little bit ambiguous, then the reader isn't going to know what we're trying to achieve or what we're getting at. Author Gregory Chiotti calls this writing to express, not impress. He says, half the battle with writing is resisting this temptation of the ego. Stick to being straightforward, trust in plain language, and don't use vocabulary to inflate weak ideas. So don't try to impress the reader with how much you know, and don't try to jam pack the text full of complicated jargon. Instead, stick to the basics and focus on clarity, and definitely don't try to inflate your ego in order to look good. Where a lot of great writers go wrong is that they think that writing a great introduction or a great hook is enough for the reader to get through the entirety of the text. But the reality is, is that a great introduction or a great hook is only enough to push them an extra 10 or 20% of the way through it. So what we need to be doing then and what we need to focus on is continually re-earning their attention to ensure that they don't get bored halfway through. So how can we continually re-earn the attention of our audience? The first way we can do this is to bluff our way through the document. And this is a standard military practice, which stands for bottom line up front. In other words, at the beginning of every paragraph, we need to make or create a sentence which summarizes what we're about to say within that paragraph. And this really forces us to make a very clear and interesting point before every block of text. Secondly, dress your thoughts. In other words, we want to find ways to reframe our thoughts in a way that is either catchy or visual. So for instance, we could say something like, uh, is exercise good for you? Or we could say something like, the life-changing magic of exercise. And you can see out of those two, which one would be the more intriguing or interesting to the reader. Another way that we can dress our thoughts is to condense lots of complicated or complex information into acronyms. Now, one example I can think of off the top of my head is Tiago Forte's course, Building a Second Brain. And he condenses the whole information of that course into an acronym, CODE which stands for capture, organize, distill, and express. And if we could use these same sort of you know, processes to condense and organize our thoughts, it's going to be really interesting and intriguing to the reader. Finally, don't repeat yourself. Now, this is something that I find particularly difficult, but the idea is that if we're using phrases like in other words, or basically, or essentially, then we didn't express our ideas clear, clear enough the first time round. There's no reason to use these phrases if we're precise with our wording the first time round. In other words, we need to ensure that we are not losing the reader's attention by using a myriad of different examples and explanations for the same point. This is perhaps the most effective writing tip I have, and it's to keep it simple. You see, writing is a democratic act. We don't want to write in a way that's going to embarrass or exclude our reader. So my advice is to write as if you're writing for a 10 or 11 year old person, and they're going to have to understand what we're trying to say. This is quite controversial, but it means using short, snappy words with minimal adjectives and adverbs. For example, why use the phrase business objectives when the word goals will do? And in the same way, we need to remove unnecessary words that are just clogging up what we're trying to say. For instance, we don't need to say the word very, or little, or kind of, or indeed. Very often, these words are not necessary. We can just, just get rid of them, and the sentence or the text that we're creating still makes perfect sense. Finally, the English language has 12 different verb tenses, from present simple to future perfect continuous. And although we don't need to know each of these verb tenses, I mean, I certainly don't, you do need to know how to use them. And to use a simple rule, you need to be using the active voice over the passive voice. So the passive voice is the idea that something is being done to something else, whereas the active voice or an active verb is something which is just done. So for example, 
we could say something in a passive voice by saying that the employee was fired by the boss. So that is a very passive voice. Whereas the active voice is simply the boss fired the employee. And you can see how that active voice is so much clearer for the reader. And that's the sort of angle that we need if we want to keep the text simple and keep the reader reading. Great writers leave you wanting more. Most of us are still prisoners of the lesson pounded into us by the composition teachers of our youth that every story must have a beginning, a middle and an end. And you know that you've reached the end of the text or the end of the essay when you begin the paragraph with something like in sum or in conclusion. And this just signals to the reader that you're about to compress what you've already said in detail into a very short paragraph. And so it's a very boring and lazy way to end your writing. The perfect ending should catch the reader slightly by surprise and yet seem exactly right. They shouldn't really expect the writing to finish so soon or so abruptly or to say what it said, but they should understand that this was the greatest point in which you should have finished your writing. As Paul Graham, who's the founder of Y Combinator, explains really nicely, Learn to recognise the approach of an ending, and when one appears, grab it. Good writing has a musical nature to it. It will flow, it will build, and it will stop at precisely the right moments. But when we read something in our head, we lose all of this. So it's really important that you take your text and read it out loud. And by doing this, you can sort of see where you trip up, where your tongue gets a little bit twisted, or where you run out of breath. And you don't want to ignore these things, like trust your gut here. If something doesn't quite sound right, you want to rephrase it or reword what you've written to ensure it sounds perfect, whether it's read out loud or read internally. Finally, like any skill, writing takes regular and deliberate practice to get good at. As E.B. White said, a writer who waits for ideal conditions under which to work will die without putting a word to paper. Stick to a schedule and have time where writing is prioritised. Now, this could be as little as five or ten minutes, but the important thing is, is that you want to have a time slot where you can go into writing mode and really focus on learning and doing that deliberate practice and actually actively trying to improve your writing skills. The problem is, is that you can know all the theory in the world about writing, but if you don't begin practicing and you don't work on your skill, then you're never going to learn to be a better writer. And without spending the time to learn how to write and how to improve my writing, I would never have had the opportunity to work as Ali Abdal's content writer. And I kind of want to show you what it's like to be a professional or full-time writer. So if you are interested in that, then do check out my video where I show you a day in the life as Ali Abdal's content writer. Anyway, I really hope you enjoyed the video and got something useful out of it. And if you enjoyed it, then please leave a thumbs up below and I shall see you next time. Goodbye.